So thank you, everyone, um, for coming. It's late on Friday, and um, I really appreciate all of you sticking around. Uh, obviously, Tender Love is next. So um, talk, louder. talk louder. All right. Is that better? All right. So before I get started, um, I just want to actually do a quick plug, because I saw the, the session behind me is actually on the imposter syndrome. And since you folks are not going to be there to, to see that, I just wanted to actually tell you a little bit about it, because actually it's a, it's a really important concept. So essentially, um, the imposter syndrome is when successful people, like software developers, feel like they might not deserve all the success they've gotten. And it's actually very common. Um, when I learned about it a few years ago, it was actually really helpful for me in my career. So when you go to conferences like these and you see uh, members of the Rails core team or the Ember core team or all the speakers and you think, wow, um, I am not worthy. Actually, you are. You, you really do belong uh, here. And, and people who are successful usually do deserve it. So Google the imposter syndrome when you get home or, or watch uh, the video when it gets posted. So to our talk. So uh, you will never believe which web framework powers Upworthy. I, uh, I can't believe the conference organizers have made everyone wait all week to figure this out, to find this out. Um, so at Upworthy, we aim to please. So we're just going to spill the beans right away. Obviously, the answer is Java struts. Awesome. Now, so um, to introduce myself, my name is Luigi. I'm the founding engineer at Upworthy. I was the first engineer hired. Uh, I've always been a software developer involved in politics and advocacy. I got really into this guy who screened Howard Dean. Um, and so I worked for his political campaign or his political action committee. Uh, I worked for other campaigns and nonprofits. And then before coming to Upworthy, I worked for the Sunlight Foundation, which is a great uh, nonprofit in DC that focuses on transparency and government and open, open government data. I'm Ryan Rosella. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Upworthy. Before this, uh, in 2011, I was a Code for America fellow, uh, the first class of fellows. I came on as a technical lead, full-time staff there. Uh, and then last year, I was on the Obama for America tech team, um, or I guess 2012, uh, working as a software engineer. And I ran out of four America organizations to work for, so I joined Upworthy. So at Upworthy, our mission, and we, this is something we truly, really believe at the company, is to drive massive amounts of attention to the topics that matter most. And that will kind of inform the engineering decisions we made as, as the tech team. So um, just to kind of give people a little uh, peek at what Upworthy does uh, for those who aren't too familiar. So uh, that might be a bit hard to read. But when we say the topics that matter most, um, these are kind of the topics we've covered in the last year, the topics that have gotten the most attention. So I'll just read some of them aloud. Uh, there's a lot of women's issues like body image, uh, gender in inequality, standards of beauty, uh, a lot of economic issues like income inequality, health policy. Uh, we also cover a lot of stuff about disability, mental health, uh, also bullying, bigotry, racial uh, profiling, and, and race issues. And when we say that we want to drive massive amounts of attention to these things, uh, what we really mean as web developers, as web engineers, is we, we want to drive massive amounts of traffic. So here's a uh, look at our growth for the last two years. So we launched a little over two years ago. Um, we started off um, at around 1.7 uh, million uniques per month. That was in our first ever month in uh, April 2012. And then we went up to, uh, in November of 2013, 190 million page views. So um, this has made us uh, a, probably around the top 40, a top 40 site in the US. Um, we're maybe one of the, the larger Rails, uh, more trafficked Rails apps out there. To give you a sense of what kind of traffic we actually deal with, here's a 24-hour graph of what our page view data looks like. So starting at midnight all the way on the left, and then ending midnight the next day, you can kind of see how during the, when the daytime happens, when, when uh, work hours start, we get these spikes, these peaks of, of, of 
of uh, traffic. This is essentially viral, the viral cycle uh, being visualized. So we have handled uh, at most about 130,000 concurrent visitors. This is a screenshot from uh, Google Analytics during one of the traffic spikes. So um, you know, we, we are handling large amounts of traffic in, in very spiky ways. So here is an example post from Upworthy. Um, this was really popular uh, about a few months ago, in, in the fall, really. Who here remembers this post? Just curious. Cool, a few of you. So um, this is what Upworthy content looks like. So it's really just static content. So see why we have an absolutely ridiculous standard of beauty in, in just 37 seconds. It's a video about how a, uh, a woman, a model, gets uh, photoshopped and looks essentially like something, like the standard of beauty that doesn't really exist. So that, that's kind of the content we were, angle we were going for. And here you see we have the content, which is basically static content on the left side of the screen. We had this sidebar with recommended content on the right side of the screen. And then scrolling down, we have what we call asks. We, we also do kind of uh, some testing on different kinds of content, different kinds of headlines. You see that down there with uh, that John Stewart video. And then we have asks around, uh, do you want to subscribe to our email list? Do you want to like us on Facebook? We also have kind of pop-ups that happen after you uh, watch a video, after you share, also asking you to do stuff. So those are the things we, we the technical things we, our technical concerns we have at Upworthy. We're pretty much a, a static site. We're a, a public site. Um, and then we have a CMS backing that. And then we have this system of dynamic uh, pop-ups and asks around the site that kind of optimize our subscriber base, get us more subscribers, get, get folks to uh, share content. So the topic of this uh, talk will really be about managing the growth of our startup's web app in the face of very high traffic. And um, I actually remember maybe five years ago sitting at a RailsConf, maybe it was in Baltimore, um, and I was sitting where you're sitting, and it was a, to it was a talk by the guys from yellowpages.com. And yellowpages.com was and still is one of the larger Rails sites in the world. Obviously, Yellow Pages is such a strong brand. Everyone goes to Yellow Pages. Uh, a lot of people still use yellowpages.com to find out local businesses and stuff like that. And they were talking about how they scaled their, app, their Rails app. And I was, thinking, I was sitting there in the audience thinking, well, this is really interesting, but I'm not sure this is ever going to apply to me. I don't really, I work on these small things. No one ever really sees them. Um, but fast forward a few years, and you know, here I am. I'm, I'm working on this, this app that millions of people see every day. Um, so it, it can really happen to you, too. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, we launched uh, in early 2012, March 26, 2012 to be exact. And at the time, there was uh, one engineer, me, and uh, our CTO, who uh, is a programmer, but was not really a Ruby or Rails developer. And we actually launched not on Rails, but on Padrino. Who here is familiar with Padrino? Cool. Who here has production apps in Padrino? No one. OK, that's what I thought. So Padrino, uh, this is, it's, it's kind of builds itself as the elegant web framework. Um, it is essentially just Sinatra with more Rails-like things on top of it. So he, he, who here has used Sinatra? More hands, of course. And who here actually has Sinatra in production? A few, a few hands, yeah. So essentially, when you're working with Sinatra, it's a, it's a more low-level library, more closer to Rack. Um, and Padrino essentially adds the things that you miss from Rails into Sinatra. It also uh, freely borrowed some really great ideas from Django. The first one being uh, first-class mountable apps. So in Rails, we have engines. But it seems like not, people don't really use engines that often. Like you might use it for Rails admin. Um, it's, you kind of might have a larger Rails app and then break it up by putting it into separate engines. But uh, with Padrino, all code actually lives in a mountable app. So you have to use this mountable app system to use it. 
It's also middleware centric. So those of you who are familiar with Rack know that there's a lot of kind of, there's this concept of middleware, it's also in Rails, um, where you can kind of write these small bits of code that are Rack compatible that sit on the stack of what you do, uh, of how requests and responses come into your Rails app or your uh, Sinatra app or, or any Rack app. And there's also this built-in admin area. And that admin area is actually an app. That's just another mountable app. So this is, uh, this is something that Django has. I know we have Rails admin here in, in the Rails world, but with Padrino, this is a thing that's built into the framework itself. So why Padrino? Why did I use Padrino in the beginning? Um, essentially, at the time, I was a seasoned Rails developer. I was probably developing for about five years on Rails. And during that time, I started to form my own opinions uh, about Rails. And some of those opinions were not uh, compatible with what the, the, the Rails way prescribed. And I saw Sinatra and Padrino as this way that I could still write Ruby. Uh, so I still loved writing Ruby. But I could also make my own choices. Um, and there's this kind of uh, epiphany that uh, seasoned web developers kind of ultimately have, which is I'm, already, I'm using this web framework, whether it be Rails or Django or Sinatra or Node, and all it's doing at the end is it's just, it's really just a, a web server, because at, at the very end, you're just getting in responses, you're just emitting HTML or CSS or JSON if it's an API or JavaScript. That's all you're really doing, and all this talk about um, TDD and uh, good object or uh, domain uh, object driven design they're they're very important they help us manage complexity um, but in the end what does the framework physically do in the air quote physical way is it it really just takes in HTTP responses uh, excuse me takes in HTTP requests and then responds with HTTP responses so while rails will give you the full foundation of how to build build a skyscraper. Uh, Padrino gives you a foundation, but it also lets you choose some of the plumbing and make some choices uh, for yourself. So the good parts about Padrino are is it really is just Ruby. It's just Rack. And if uh, you're a fan of thinking in that mindset, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. There is less magic. Uh, things are more explicit. It's unopinionated. All the generators. When you, you, when you generate a Padrino app, you specifically say what you want. Uh, that you want Active Record versus Data Mapper versus Mongoid, or you want uh, SAS versus LESS versus ERB. Whatever, um, whatever you want, you can specify it. I actually enjoy the process of writing middleware. I like thinking about web apps like that. I think it's a much more performant way to think about writing web apps. And Padrino itself, unlike Rails, is, is, is light, it's performant, it's really just Sinatra with a few more libraries on top of it. So this is what our uh, architecture looked like when we launched. So the whole big box is a Padrino, is the Padrino app. And we had two um, mounted apps inside it, main, the public site. So when you visited upworthy.com, this is what the public would see, those, those content pages. And then we had the admin tool, the built-in admin app in Padrino, which essentially functioned as our CMS. And keep in mind that we, we were hoping that we're going to launch this thing and that we're going to get lots of traffic. Um, and so we needed to figure out how to scale it right away, right from the get-go. So I kind of devised this, this idea um, called explicit caching. And, I remembered um, back in the early 2000s, there was this blogging framework called, or blogging tool called Movable Type. And Movable Type was what all the big, those early blogs used. And um, Movable Type essentially, the way it worked is it was a CMS, so when you saved your post to the database, Movable Type would actually save, obviously, uh, see that you saved something to the database, and then it would render the HTML right then and then write the HTML to disk. So when your uh, 
when people visited your blog that was hosted on movable type, they weren't hitting that Perl app and going through the database. They were actually just hitting these rendered HTML files and CSS, JavaScript, uh, that were just living on the file system of your server. So I, I actually was drawn to that idea. I, I liked that idea. So I kind of re, re made it a little bit here in Padrino. So in the admin app, there was this publisher object. And the publisher object essentially did that, where once anything was saved to the CMS, any content was saved to the CMS, the publisher object would see that. It would actually make a request to the main uh, app, which was actually rendering the public site. And uh, it would write that rendered response to Redis. And so Redis cache was a middleware layer. Uh, I talked about middleware earlier that sat very close to the front of this Padrino app. So when we had a million or so page views in that first month, they were all really being served from Redis. Essentially, the website was just in memory in Redis. And so that worked. It, you know, it scaled well. So around this time, uh, June 2012, we hired our second Rails engineer, Josh French. Um, so uh, he kind of joined the team, and then a few weeks later, he said, guys, I think we should switch to Rails. And he was, he was probably right, because there were pain points that were not related really to the technical performance of Padrino, but actually more about social aspects of it. The first one being that the ecosystem for libraries, while, while pretty good, because, again, Padrino is just Sinatra, just Rack, uh, was not as strong as Rails. There's just libraries for everything you want to do in Rails. We, we, there were many things we could do in, in Padrino, uh, but the, the kind of uh, quality of those libraries was not as high. A part of that is because Padrino isn't that popular. It wasn't very frequently maintained. Um, the actual admin app was not very pleasant to look at. It was its own HTML, CSS styling. I put a star here because literally once the, sec the day we moved off of Padrino fully, uh, they released a new, a new release which was which had the admin system in Bootstrap, which is what we wanted all along. And um, there was no community. And as a startup, it's like actually easier to hire Rails developers, because we can't really go, hey, we know you're a great Rails developer, but you're going to have to work on this thing called Padrino. Um, that wasn't really a, a, a strong sell. So we decided to move. Uh, we wanted to move to Rails. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we're a growing startup. We're getting lots of traffic. Um, so how do we kind of balance this desire to move, to move our architecture uh, while still uh, you know, maintaining a running app, while still having a, maintain, a stable running app that, that is serving a growing traffic base? And Ryan's going to continue. So uh, we started our Rails migration um, in October 2012. Uh, and so this is a timeline. This is October 2012. Uh, and basically, the way it started, um, we generated a new Rails app, uh, moved all the, um, we mounted it inside the routes RB. So we just basically mounted. And you, you can do the same thing with Sinatra, so it's Rack. Uh, and then we slowly migrated uh, the models and utilities into the app. And uh, so when I joined, we were kind of in this weird hybrid state. I joined in January of 2013 after taking a nice long siesta, re-electing the president and stuff. Um, and so we had to figure out how could we accelerate uh, and just you know get us over the final hurdle and just move us onto Rails completely and get out of Padrino. Uh, so the first step uh, that I did was migrating the assets. And so we activated the Rails asset pipeline, which had been turned off uh, in our app. Migrated the front end assets, the back end assets. Uh, that took us about a week in February 2013. Uh, the next step was deciding if we wanted to do the admin area or our front end area first. Uh, so we decided to do the hard part first and do the front end. So we migrated all the front end code, uh, the views and controllers, which took another two weeks. Uh, and then lastly, we, we did the entire uh, back end CMS system as the final push, uh, and we added, we changed it to Bootstrap, moved all the Rails controllers. That took us another uh, two weeks. So here at this point, the entire migration uh, is eight months, but it's really, uh, it really ends up getting accelerated in the last few 
uh, weeks just because we wanted to get to that, that final push. Um, and at this point, we're at three Rails developers, me, myself, Luigi, um, and, oh, sorry, myself, Josh, and Luigi. Uh, and our CTO goes back to actually doing CTO uh, work, which is great. So now here we are, we're in a monolith. We're in a big, huge monorail. Um, for the entire 2013, we were able to do things the Rails way. We were able to increase our velocity uh, and just able to add uh, lots of features. We were able to program the way we wanted to and uh, really get things moving. We didn't have to rebuild helpers that were, weren't existing. And so we could just have this one huge uh, monolithic Rails app. We had the back end CMS, and then we had our front end, and then we had our, all our AJAX endpoints. But um, one of the things when you're looking at this monorail uh, is how are you scaling for virality? So on the, uh, on the campaign, there was a lot of traffic, and uh, it was pretty easy to know that you know, in November, it's going to be really busy, or in October, there's a voter deadline, so it's going to be very specific of when traffic's going to hit. It's, you can you could tell. Uh, in, in the viral media world, you don't know if your post is going to be a hit or not. You don't know when it's going to gain traction. And so you can't have someone sitting there monitoring 24 hours a day when to scale, when to not scale. Uh, so we had to think about how we were going to do that. So a lot of it was just pretty simple, basic stuff here. Uh, we added action caching. So we, took, uh, we removed the homegrown publisher system, just turned on action caching in Rails, and uh, it's backed by memcache. So people would hit the page. You would hit the memcache instance of the page instead of going out, hitting our database, pulling in the page. Uh, we were able to just do that. The second part was moving our assets on S3 and CloudFront. So our app is hosted on Heroku. Uh, there's actually this really easy tutorial on Heroku on how to do this. You just set up a CloudFront instance, uh, and then uh, you just point your config host for the, the CDN for your assets to that, and it magically works. It's great. Um, and then the third thing is uh, we had lots of Heroku dynos. So at the time, we were running uh, up to 40 Heroku dynos, and these were 1x uh, dynos at the time. So uh, mainly, these are for our AJAX requests, so the, those asks, those pop-ups, and the different things that ask you around the site, uh, we'll really need to scale with those. So we ran this uh, for a while, um, and we, we had some slowness on the site sometimes, so uh, we tried to figure out what could we do to make sure that our site would be stable and not have to worry about um, these viral traffic spikes having to scale up and down. So we actually implemented um, a CDN in front of it. Uh, we took some time and tried to figure out what CDN we wanted because we wanted to do pass-through posts and just different things. And uh, at the time, we ended up on Fastly. So Fastly is a uh, reverse proxy. It runs on Varnish. Uh, it's made, uh, you guys should check it out. It's great. Um, we moved all of that to, uh, all our HTML, CSS, and images to Fastly. And then uh, we turned off the Rails action caching. And the way uh, Fastly works is it, re it reads your headers on your page. So you just set, uh, set expire four hours from now. So our site could literally, literally be down for four hours, and Fastly would continue to serve the pages. From there, we were able to di uh, dial down our Heroku dynos. So we went to, uh, we switched to the 2x dynos, and uh, we only needed about half as many dynos uh, because we were only serving uh, off the Heroku dyno for AJAX requests. Probably the biggest thing that we learned um, from Fastly was the mobile performance gains. So uh, Fastly has all these different uh, locations around the world. Um, if I'm in California requesting a page from upworthy.com, it's going to go to your cl the closest point of presence, the CDN location in California, instead of going out to Heroku in Virginia, pulling from the data center and bring it back. So. Uh, the, the load times went way down, and we were able to uh, fully cache the site, and we had, we've had zero downtime since implementing uh, Fastly. So it's just been a great performance gain for us. So um, with having a big monorail, there's huge pain points uh, that come along with it. Uh, we, so we have one app that deals with our, our dub, dub, dub serves upworthy.com, and then we have a back-end CMS that uh, our, our curators log into and do their work. So we had uh, to figure out the concerns with that. So it's, it's really painful there. Um, when there's traffic spikes on the public site, it could uh, basically ma makes our CMS unstable. So a curator would log into our site, try to do their work, and they couldn't navigate. And we just have to tell them, 
you know, come back later or come and do the work later. And uh, w when the traffic spike comes down, you'll be able to use it. Um, and as our team grow, the code base is becoming very large. So uh, the classes will get huge, and you know, the front end didn't care about some of the stuff the back end did. So uh, it just got harder and harder to maintain. So of course, what do we do? We break up here. Uh, fun fact, this is actually filmed in Chicago. Um, in December 2013, uh, our buddy Josh French has another great idea. He says, hey, I think we should really start splitting up the Rails app. Uh, and so if you look how, at this timeline, it's pretty evenly spaced. We didn't just jump into different uh, things and start building them. We like, took some time on each of these sections and really focused on, on that narrow gap. Um, so one of the things is when you're trying to decide how to break up your Rails app into services, how do you do it? There's plenty of different ways you can do it. Uh, this is the way we did it. This is not the perfect prescription for everybody. I think you just have to look at your app and see like where the clear dividing lines are. Uh, so we basically, we just chose two right now. So we have our www site and we have our, our backend CMS. So there's a clear dividing line between the two. Uh, what we ended up doing is cloning each repo into its own separate repository so we could maintain the Git repo history. And then from there, we started breaking everything up, right? So this is what we need for this side, this is what we need for this side, and let's start chopping, uh, which was, ended up being a lot of deleting and removing namespaced objects. So uh, once we did that, we deployed uh, each of these app to ser uh, separate Heroku applications. The nice thing about Heroku is they have this function called Heroku Fork, so it'll just take your current app, it'll fork it into another Heroku app, pull over all your plugins, everything you need. Uh, so we did that, we forked the app, our, the main, our main app into two separate applications, removed the plugins that we didn't need on each side, and then we pushed out our applications to those Heroku sites. Everything's working great. Uh, and all we had to do was switch our Fastly endpoint to point at the new Heroku app at origin, and we're done. So zero downtime uh, really helped there. Uh, and then we continued to deduplicate the, the two apps. So we created this core gem that uh, is holding a lot of the code that shares between the two apps. So our CMS runs on about two, two 2x Heroku dynos, and then now our uh, front end app runs about 25 to 30 2x dynos. Uh, this is pretty much what this looks like. So we just have an app called www, and then we have an app called CMS, and then this gem shares the code between it. Uh, people will hit the Fastly endpoint between www and, uh, and our app. So what are the real benefits of a service-oriented architecture? I think there's, there's plenty if you look uh, and think about it. One of the big things is we talked about the instability. Um, you know, if our curators couldn't do their work, they, you know, we can't have like articles go out, so it gets kind of annoying. So uh, if you know, there's a problem in one app, it's, it's easier to fix and maintain. Um, each of them have different scaling needs. So the interesting thing is our CMS, where we have you know like 20 users that use our CMS. So we could we could you know have it at 2x dynos instead of having like 30 dynos serving all these different pages. So the scaling needs uh, was really beneficial here. And that also divides our teamwork more naturally. So uh, we can have people uh, we can have engineers on a team uh, decide to you know work on different parts or features. And we don't have to wait for something to ship or something else to finish. But of course, there's you know there's a bunch of drawbacks uh, running an SOA. If you're on the full stack and you want to uh, make a feature on our CMS that needs to carry all the way through the funnel to the front end, you have to have both uh, all three environments running on their system uh, to make sure that you know your change goes and it funnels all the way through. Uh, coordinating deploys is also a huge pain. So if you need something that's in the core gem plus the CMS plus the WWW app. That means you have to deploy each three, uh, coordinate them, and make sure that all of them are happening at the same time, or all of them go in a certain order, which, uh, when you're on the monolith, it's really easy to just push one big Rails app out. And then migrating to a fully dry set of code bases is really tedious. Trying to figure out what, uh, what needs to go where and where we put stuff is just, um, it's just been a really hard uh, thing to do. So some of the future work that we're going to continue to do on the SOA uh, we're going to continue to add stuff to our core gem. 
remove deduplication, which is, it's kind of a pain sometimes to figure out uh, where, you know, what things go where. And then we're considering making the, uh, breaking up the app even more. So right now we have two apps. We have this third app that actually uses almost all our Heroku dynos. So we're thinking about making that um, its own separate app and service, and we can ping that. Um, and then, you know, they all communicate with these different data stores. Should we just use... A lot of times, an SOA has that service layer, and everything communicates with that service layer. So maybe we should move to that. Cool. So um, just some to wrap up here, some lessons learned. Uh, so first, really, when you're when you're working on an app for a company, and you're, you're there's a feature requests, there's all these other things going on in your company, really do wait to make these big technical architectural changes until everything starts to really, really hurt, until you really feel the pain. And once you do decide to make these changes, it's okay to take a really long time. We're probably going to take eight months to do the fully SOA system that we envisioned back in the beginning of the year. And that's just because we have other feature requests from the rest of the company to fulfill. And luckily, as uh, since we're on Ruby, it kind of makes it easier to do that. It really made it easier when we were moving from, from Padrino to Rails. Um, serve everything you possibly can from a CDN. I don't think people use CDNs enough. They're just hugely beneficial to the performance of your system. Uh, they're great for end users, particularly mobile users. At Upworthy, we have well over 50% of our traffic comes from phones and tablets. And CDNs really, really help there. So remember that you're just dealing with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, JSON maybe at the end of the day. Right? That's all you're serving. So think about how you can most efficiently serve those resources from your app. And uh, if you are in your, doing your own startup, if you're working on your own project, I, I hope you can also experience this kind of high traffic growth because it's been a hugely fun and rewarding experience for the both of us. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm Luigi. He's Ryan. Our uh, slides and a write-up is already on our GitHub um, engineering blog. And we will be happy to answer questions. <laughs>